All right. Indestructible leaders. I got some notes today. Actually did some notes. It's been a while, but I put some, some notes together. I have a conversation with y'all. All y'all. It's my new Southern accent. You like it? I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> So building off of last week, a little bit, I wanted to talk this week about government, which is not a topic. Lower this a little bit. Yeah, it's better. This is not a topic I've ever heard anybody teach on in church. Um, I spent years listening to um, Gary DeMar and his teachings and CDs and DVDs and reading his books. And um, he had a podcast. Uh, he still has a podcast, but he had a podcast years ago when I was in high school. And I remember listening to hours and hours and hours of Gary um, expounding on eschatology and on politics. And it really was an eye-opening experience. Uh, and then combine that with the years of more eschatology study myself, then covenant, then kingdom and supernatural and the fivefold ministry, church government, all that stuff. Um, so I've arrived at a way of seeing the world and seeing politics uh, that I want to share with you some thoughts today and from scripture and from um, an American perspective, a Christian kingdom American perspective. Uh, I don't know where you're all from that you're you're watching this um and maybe people watch it six months from now i don't know where you're from either and so you might have a european perspective a south american perspective an african perspective there's many perspectives on this um but i'm going to share uh from some of what i've come to some of my uh conclusions and I am sitting on my front porch, so I may get an Amazon delivery or who knows what. They're quite active on our street, so, and on my porch. Um, so as I said, I'm coming from this certain perspective. So some things may land, some things may be um, hard to understand if you're not from an American uh, location. Location. If you're not American, if you're not an American, uh, it may be unrelated in some ways. But I want to lay out some concepts for you. And we'll start with this. A lot of people say that America, in particular, has a Christian history background. Christian constitution, a Christian government, a uh, Christian basis and foundation. Many of its founders were believers or deists. And so some of that is true, but even more, because when people dig into it and they say, well, the constitution doesn't have Bible verses in it. It doesn't say, you know, first Timothy, da, da, da. Like it's not a Christian document in the sense of like scripture. And that's true, but it was built on a philosophy that is a Christian philosophy that is the foundation, even if it is not a necessarily chapter and verse Bible foundation. It is a Christian philosophy that went into the Declaration of Independence, that went into the uh, many of the Federalist Papers that went into the Constitution, and in particular, I will mention the Bill of Rights. Now, there have been many amendments 
that have been added to the Constitution over time. Um, but the part of the original document was the first 10 amendments, which were referred to historically as the Bill of Rights. Now, part of the concept here is that these are God-given human rights that have been given to human beings. Say, for example, in the first one, it talks about uh, freedom of speech. That is a God-given human right. It is not something that is a privilege per se. Oh, well, as long as you say certain things and the government is okay with that, then we'll allow it. But then if you say something else and we're not okay with that, we're going to shut you down. We're going to censor you. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to lock you up and punish you. Which if you think about it, for most of human history, that is how it was. Whether you're dealing with Egyptian pharaohs or Babylonian kings or, uh, uh, you know, Mongolian horde or whatever, all the dictators of Europe over the centuries and millennia of dictators warring with each other, if they didn't like what you had to say, let's just cut your head off. They send somebody to assassinate you, get rid of you. This is what we've dealt with for most of human history. And the fact that what they did here is they they gave a philosophical statement to say that we believe these are God-given human rights. It's a bill of rights that every human has that will not be infringed. When you get to the second one, and it talks about weapons, it talks about uh, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Why is that being said? Because Every human being should have the human right to defend themselves. It's not only the government that is allowed to have weapons, whether it's police officers or the military, and they're the only ones who are allowed to have weapons. No, every single human being should have the ability and the right to protect and defend themselves, whether that's against a thief breaking into your home in the middle of the night, or whether that's Joe Biden showing up at your front door to enforce vaccine mandates. No, all of it is an overreach of corruption and of evil. And the Bill of Rights puts in there this right for you to defend yourself with weaponry so that a tyrannical state government does not come and take over. You think about the context, this is not protecting the rights of gun owners to be able to go hunt and fish. That's not what they're writing about in the first uh, uh, drafting of the Constitution when they're trying to lay out the rights to protect yourself against a tyrannical state, because that's literally what they're dealing with with King George. And because of that, they're wise enough to set into foundation a protection so that this does not occur again. So God-given rights, not privileges. It's not that the government gives you the privilege to have a gun, the privilege to have free speech, the privilege to not have your property seized or to have your home searched with an un, you know, without cause, without due cause. The right is to have a quick speedy trial and not languish in prison for years and decades without a fair public trial by a jury of your peers. But instead, that's, that's a human right. It's not a privilege that the government can take away from you. So this is how our country was set up, is that, okay, if we're going to have a government, this government that's put into place has to acknowledge that the people have these fundamental human rights. As long as the government recognizes these people have these fundamental human rights, then the government will be allowed to function and operate, but the government will always be subservient to these list of rules that we're creating called the Constitution. This is the contract between whatever government gets put in place and the people 
is that the government will be subject to the Constitution. The Constitution will ultimately stand above and beyond whatever government politicians and leaders are put into place. They will always have to swear their oath, their allegiance, their duty to the Constitution because the Constitution is the real ruler of our land. So moving a little further, as far as from a kingdom perspective, this leads to the fruit of the spirit, which is self-control. The concept here is as long as the government is in place, it's actually to protect the people in their self-government. It, the part of the role of the government that's put into place is to protect the rights of the people. So conceptually, I want to lay this out. So Romans 13. In Romans 13, Paul is writing and he says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Okay. We'll pause there. A lot of people will quote that and they will think in terms of, well, Paul's writing in the first century under the evil emperor Nero, and he's writing saying, God has set this up. And then they'll try to carry that over to say, well, God put George Bush in office. God put Trump in office. God put Barack Obama in office. God put and they'll fill in the blank. And it does not carry over like that. The idea of honor, the, the governing authorities, God has put them into place. See, the ruling governing authority in America is not the president. It's not the senators. It's not the representatives. It's not the judges. The ruling governing authority in America, in the United States of America, is the U.S. Constitution. Everybody who serves in government is subservient to the true ruler of our country, which is the Constitution. So when we find these different passages that talk about how we interact with the government, we have to pull it out of its context and understand that our context is different. Nero is not the king of our country. The constitution is the king of our country. The president just gets turned for four years to serve the people, maybe eight years, but he gets a turn to be a public servant who is under the authority of the constitution. The real governing power of our country is the Constitution. We have no kings. We have no monarch. Our only king is actually the Constitution. So if we're going to look at this and say, Paul said that God put the authorities into positions of power. Well, God put in our country the Constitution into the position of power. And we honor the Constitution in our country as the king. Let's say, for example, the other passages, I believe one is in First Timothy. Paul talks about praying for those who are in authority, 
that your life, you may live peaceful, quiet, godly, sensible lives, something like that. What are we actually praying for? Pray for the Constitution. I know that seems strange because we think, well, we got to pray for the sitting president. We got to pray for our senators. We got to pray for our representatives. Yes, but that's not actually the king of our country. And if you really want to be wise about this, I would say pray for the Constitution to be protected, to be valued, to be honored, to be upheld, to be regarded. See, if you think about the Supreme Court, part of their job as the highest court in the land is to interpret whether the Constitution says certain things or doesn't, and they are the strongest, highest level of interpreters and appliers of the Constitution in our society. So when they looked at the abortion Roe versus Wade this last, last year, they said, you know what, there's nothing in the Constitution that protects a constitutional right to kill your unborn infant. There's nothing in the Constitution that protects that. That's not a given human right. It's not in here. How the hell have we for 50 years allowed this to exist in our culture and society as if it's built into as a human right into our constitution. It's not in here. And so they said, we got to strike this down. I don't know how we got away with this for 50 years, lying to ourselves. It's not in here. So now we shift it back to the states and let the states decide if they want it to be legal for themselves or not. But we cannot fundamentally, intellectually, honestly believe that there is a human right for abortion in the Constitution that was written 200 plus years ago. It's not there. And when they acknowledge that, they overturned it. And everybody gets all upset. Oh, it's a, uh, you know, whatever. But they were honoring the Constitution. So yes, pray that the Constitution would be honored, protected, obeyed, that those who are put into positions of government and power and public service would actually honor and protect this document and implement it and value the, va value the rights that are put within it. This is a proper way to understand that. Part of the, this passage in Romans 13 is it actually tells us the purpose of government at least according to how the reason God put government into place is to punish evil doers. Now, as a teacher of the better covenant, I also still believe in punishment. I don't believe that God is punishing. I don't believe that the punishment comes from the church. I don't believe that punishment is something that is necessarily um, something that that is in those contexts but what i do see here is that god as it says in romans 13 gave the power of the sword to the government to be agents of wrath to deal with evil doers it's it's a power that god has given to governments now in our culture the government that he gave that power to is the constitution. And underneath the constitution, we have the public servants and they have a level of power to actually put down wrongdoers, but that's actually the purpose of the government is to deal with evil doers. Now, Paul, one of the definitions of the evil doer would be somebody who is violating your self-government. If somebody comes along and tries to censor you, if somebody comes along and tries to uh, quarter themselves in your home without your permission, they're going to be squatting in your home and they're going to be taking over a bedroom in your house without your permission, uh, especially if they're a soldier of the government. These different things, the, the idea that uh, they can unlawfully search your home or your vehicle without your permission, if they are violating these things, 
the Constitution gives the power to stop that. If they try to take away your right to defend yourself, the Constitution is to step in and say, hell no, you don't have the right to take away people's right to self-defense. So putting down evildoers would actually be putting down those who are trying to violate the fundamental human rights that are built into our constitutional government, which is the highest law of the land. Now, if you carry that over and you say, okay, purpose of government is actually to protect self-control. One of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. This is highly valued in the kingdom of God. It's important and valuable in the kingdom of God that everybody is controlling themselves. If you think back, even in the Garden of Eden, sets it all up and says you have autonomy you can eat whatever you can do whatever just one rule and the one rule was the constitution of the garden of eden before the fall don't eat from the fruit of this particular tree when they violated that one rule of that very tiny constitution that was put into place in the garden of eden then they became the evildoers and now they were punished Another thing we have to understand, at least about our country in particular, is that it's a republic. It's a constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. Thank God we are not a democracy. A democracy is majority rules. Let's say, for example, that you are um, in the Old West, cowboy movie kind of times, and a mob comes along, a mob of people and they grab you and they drag you to the main street and the sheriff comes out and he says, well, what did he do wrong? And more than half the crowd says, he stole from you know Bob Johnson's uh, uh, horse livery and we need to string him up right now. And the sheriff were to look and say, well, more than half of you Think that you need to string him up right now. So go for it. Go hang him. See, that's a democracy. That's majority rule. 51% of the mob group says, string him up. You're going to get strung up because the majority wins. That's not what we have in our country. In our country, we have a republic form of government, which the republic is you drag the man to Main Street and you say, well, he needs to be strung up. And the sheriff says, no, 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 no. This is not how we do it. We have a system of rules and government here. We're going to pull him into the sheriff's station. He's going to stay in here until a judge is here in town. Then we'll set up a jury of his peers. We will have a fair trial. And if the judge and the jury agree and rule on this and he is found guilty, then they will determine his punishment. They will cause his punishment to take place. The government has the power to actually enforce wrath and rules and judgment and put down evildoers. But the mob group does not. The 51% majority does not. See, if you were to, I have a friend who, uh, he was, oh, back in college, there was some group of people that uh, he was talking with who were challenging him that we're not a democracy. And he'd never heard such a concept. And they said, read through the Constitution itself, and I'll give you $1,000 for every time you see the word democracy. It's like, okay. So he reads through it, word for word, the whole thing. And he realized... He didn't make a cent. He didn't make one penny because it is not written as a democracy. We are written as a constitutional republic where the ruling law of the land is what is in charge, not the majority rulership. 
in the land. Because you really have a few options. You can have a republic where you have the, the rules of the land, law and order, that is the ruler. Or second, you have a majority rule, which is democracy. Or you can have a monarchy or a dictatorship where the government, whether it's a king, a king and queen, a family line, whatever, they are the ones who dictate and they are in charge. An emperor, a king, uh, whatever. That kind of rulership is the dictator, the monarch. Then you have the majority rule, the mob rule. Uh, and then third, you have a republic. Those are really your three main options of government. There's lots of names where those things break down into a little bit of differences, but really big picture, there's kind of three main differences. So if you start carrying over some of this, you start to see that God over and over and over again likes to work inside of republics where he will set up a constitutional republic, but we'll call them covenantal republics in the sense of he makes an agreement with his people and sets up a list of rules and says, now we're both obligated to follow these rules. I'll be your God. You be my people. Here's the rules that we will follow. If you do this, if you do this, if you do this, I'll bless you. If you do this, I'll curse you. If you do this, things will go well for you. You'll live long. You'll prosper. If you do this, your camels will be unhappy and your land won't produce any fruit. And he gives out the rules. And in that kind of system, he's actually putting himself under the constitution of the covenant contract that he's created with the people. He's actually putting the covenant above himself. That's where he says he puts his word above his name. His name is who he is, his being as a person. His word is his contract in the covenant. So he puts his contract in the covenant above who he is as a person when he submits himself to that kind of relationship with us. If you look at Jesus himself in John 13, where he washes the feet of the disciples, right before that, it says he knew that he'd come from God, that he was returning to God, and that he had been given all power. He's given all power. What does he do with all power? He washes feet. He washes feet. In the new covenant, he creates the new covenant of the forgiveness of sins of many. And his new command, I give you, John 13, he says, a new command I give you, love as I have loved you. That is his new covenant contract. That is the constitution of the republic of the kingdom that we live in. Now, I say republic of the kingdom because we are not simply slaves under some sort of theocracy. We are actually kings, and he's the king of kings. A king is self-governing. A king is self-ruling. And as a king, you are a king. Well, you might be a lady. You can say you're a queen, but carry it over, all right? I'm the bride of Christ. You're a king. There we go. So as a king, you have a self-ruling, self-control fruit of the Holy Spirit that makes you self-governing. When people talk about the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and says, these are the government of the church. No, 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 no. The government of the church is family. Fathers and mothers are the leaders who govern the family of God. See, the way that he ideally does government is through family. When he sets up the Garden of Eden and he puts in a governor, he puts in a husband and wife and says, multiply, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. His version of government officials is family. 
it's not a top-down structure like we see in Matthew 22 when Jesus is talking and he says, don't try to be like Herod and his system where you rule over and have power over and control over others. That's not the kingdom way. Or in another passage where he talks about don't buy into the leaven of Herod. Not just the leaven of the Pharisees, but the leaven of Herod, which is about power and control over other people. Instead, have power and control over yourself as a king and recognize that you have a constitution in the kingdom, which is the new covenant command, love as I have loved you, love like Jesus loves, and this is our government system. And see, there are times where there are evildoers, even in the new covenant kingdom system, and those evildoers need to be put down. And we see it inside of the New Testament. For example, when Jesus is rebuking in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches, he rebukes the Nicolaitans. And we don't know a whole lot about what the Nicolaitans did wrong. But the name Nicolaitan translates to the, um, uh, oh, let's see if I get this right, the, it's the controller of the people. It's like the, the domination is part of the word for Nicolaitans, that they domin dominate the people. They are the dominators of the people. That's what the word actually translates to. Then we also have in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 10, it talks about false apostles and how they lord it over you. And they are controlling and they desire money and they don't have any supernatural fruit in their life. And then in uh, 2 John, it talks about a leader named uh, Diotrephes. Diotrephes, you don't hear this one very often, but it talks about how he loves to be first and he loves to be the number one at gatherings. They're talking about love feasts, that he loves to be first. He loves to be number one. There's something about wanting to be first and there's a ruling there. There's an overlording there. See, in the kingdom, you can either be on one end like Jesus, who is a foot washing public servant leader who makes him the king of kings because he's the greatest servant. Or on the other end, you can be like Nicolaitans, the false apostles, or Dio Trevis, uh, who actually are trying to be number one, trying to control people, trying to dominate people. These are your options. So this week, we're talking in context about government. I hope this was enlightening, eye-opening, challenging, stretching. I hope it gets you thinking and processing in terms of how can I actually be praying for my government? Now, I don't know your government. If you're not American, there's so many examples of other styles of government that are out there. Maybe you could be praying that they would be replaced by a constitutional republic. That would be ideal. But for those of us who live under this constitutional republic, I pray that our government leaders would obey and honor and value the human rights in the Bill of Rights, our constitution and the amendments therein, that they would go back to a, this philosophical foundation of our God-given human rights, protect our freedom of speech, our right to own property, our right to protect our property, our right to protect our families and, our, and ourselves. This is what I pray for. This is why I pray against mandates. I pray against forcing things on people that violates our actual government of this land. When it comes to forced masking, forced vaccinations, forced all the propaganda that's being taught to children in schools, all these things, we're violating the human rights 
inside of our constitution. I would also challenge you, type in the Bill of Rights into Google and read. There's just, it's gonna take you this much time, to this much to read those 10 articles and really wrestle with what do these mean? Some of them are, are strange. Some of them seem like uh, uh, maybe does that apply? Do I see that nowadays? Is it still important? Why did they do this? Give it a little, little homework. Do a little homework on this and dig into it. Spend a few minutes. Maybe you haven't looked at it since high school or grade school. Maybe you've never looked at it because knowing some schools, and there was a report this week that came out that 53 schools in, in the Chicago area in Illinois have zero students, zero that are proficient at math and reading. 53 schools that have zero students proficient at math and reading. Why is it important that the church gets a hold of understanding and be able to teach and grasp the concepts of government? Because the church used to understand it, and that's how we got this incredible kingdom government put into place in America 200 plus years ago, is because godly men and women understood biblical understanding of government and philosophy to create such a gem, a shining light on a hill. And now, the more that we have stupid people either running our churches or our schools, it dumbs down the population and it puts our constitution and our government and our freedoms and our God-given rights in danger. It's important that we as leaders understand this and that we start to pass this on to the next generation because they aren't getting it in school. They aren't even getting math and reading in some schools. So we have got to get a hold of this and understand it and pass it along. That's why I wanted to put a little time into this today. Uh, for those of you, if you haven't done it yet, there is a Facebook group for indestructible leaders. Make sure you take a minute to go join it. I will get you in there, approve your request, and we will chat about some of this some more. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I can't think of anything else I was going to say. Um, if you haven't gotten yourself a co copy of the commentary yet, the Better Covenant commentary from Acts to Revelation is available on Amazon. Go check it out. I don't promote my stuff very often, but I'm just mentioning, go check it out. It is beautiful and we have copies. It's in stock. Go grab one. All right, guys, have a great day from the free state of South Carolina.